Uh, welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast, and we're here uh, at the uh, in Melbourne at the World Federation of Nuclear Medicine and Biology, and. We're going to do something a bit different today. Um, we're going to talk to Barbara Hertz, and we're really not going to talk to Barbara Hertz about what she did. We're going to talk to Barbara Hertz about what her dad did. And um, uh, so uh, let's start with uh, saying, uh, who's your dad? My dad was Dr. Saul Hertz. Yeah. Uh, he was born in Cleveland in 1905 and passed in 1950. So why on earth would we, would we want to know about Saul Hertz? Well, uh, he had an interesting journey. Uh, he, d he is the doctor who discovered the medical uses of radioiodine and essentially is the, um, set off the, in motion, the nuclear medicine and particularly um, the use of radioactive iodine as the gold standard First, theranotics in treating um, cancer. Right. Um, so, when did he uh, first come up with this idea? Well, it was a process. In the beginning, the first step was asking a pivotal question in Boston at a lecture um, in Harvard Medical School in 1936 when uh, the president of MIT came for a speech and a luncheon meeting. Uh, almost 80 years. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a long time ago. Um, yes. And it's interesting that Theranostics is, is really coming into mainstream now, <laughs> right? So, um, yes. except in thyroid disease, it's always been there for, for it's been there yes. for a very long time, yes. thyroid disease. So, mm. so the impact of something your dad did a very long time ago mm -hmm. um, is only now really picking up full time steam and become mainstream medicine in many ways. And, mm. and it's not quite there in mainstream medicine, and, and we need members of the mm -hmm. public to help us with this, but, uh, but, but I, think, uh, uh, I think it's rapidly heading in a direction. So, yeah. so, so what did he suggest? What did he say? Well, um, in 1936, um, he asked President Compton, could iodine be made radioactive artificially? And just to note, it was only two years after the Curies had discovered artificial radioactivity. He had already understood the use of iodine in the uptake uh, of the thyroid, right. in that he had been utilizing a stable iodine in the treatment of hypothyroidism. Right. So this really is a eureka moment right. um, for medical science in putting together the uh, radioactivity aspect and the iodine treatment. Right. So, so he, uh, he had the idea of making it radioactive, but when did he have the idea of doing something with it and, uh, and actually got hold of radioactive iodine? Well, it was pretty straight away. They got some money together from Harvard Medical School, of which he was a graduate, um, albeit unusual because when he went to Harvard, there were very strict quotas, and there was only two outsiders there in his class. Um, but um, they hired a physicist, Dr. Arthur Roberts at MIT, and Dr. Roberts uh, fresh out of having his PhD, developed the I-128 without a cyclotron. Right. Um, and they utilized that in injecting rabbits um, in the early part of 1937. And they found that the altered thyroid gland responded to the uh, radioactive iodine, albeit it was a short period of time that they had. and. Um, and that was really a major step forward for nuclear medicine. And by the way, there was no nuclear medicine sure. at the time. Sure. So, mm. so when did they first use it in humans? Um, they got money from the Markle Foundation, $30,000, to build a cyclotron at oh. MIT. After, um, and the cyclotron was operational in the beginning of 1941. And by then, um, um, Glenn Seaborg and John Livingood had developed um, I-130 and I-131 out in California. Right. So um, in 1941, um, 
in the early part of 1941. They injected t just 2.1 millicaries. Doesn't seem like very much, does it? Um, to Elizabeth D., the first patient at the Mass General Hospital using I-130 that was produced on the uh, Marco MIT cyclotron. Right. And uh, so they, they gave that, and, and what did they find? Well, um, they gradually built up a, a series of 29 cases, and by using dosimetry and by using personalized precision medicine, Yay. Right. <laughs> um, they were able to meet success in um, treating these patients with right. hypothyroidism. It's an interesting thing though, Rob, because in 1937 when they were doing the um, rabbit studies, Dr. Hertz believed strongly that uh, the radioactive iodine would be therapeutic for thyroid carcinoma. Right and uh, followed that up um, when he uh, came back from World War II serving his nation and um, at the Beth Israel Hospital uh, developed more fully the radioiodine for treating thyroid uh, patients. In fact, even at Mass General and before he went to, into the service in 1942, he was able to do some preliminary uh, clinical trials on thyroid cancer patients. However, as he reported in the Markle Foundation report, um, it hadn't been effective. It, did, it wasn't taken up by the cancerous thyroid. Right, because we, we, uh, we know that some uh, thyroid cancers uh, don't necessarily take up uh, radioactive iodine or the primary often doesn't take up the radioactive iodine, and sometimes mm -hmm. the metastases do. So, right. so he so, was on track, though. He, yeah, was, yeah. he was doing his right. thing. <laughs> right. So, Make it so, happen. so. But then he did. He did uh, go on and, and treat thyroid cancer. Yes, and he strongly believed um, after the war. He corresponds with Mass General that he felt that. Um, the use of radioactive substances in the treatment of thyroid cancer really held the key for cancer in general. Right. And no pun intended, but he was right on he target. Was completely right. <laughs> um, and, and so, yes, I mean, it's interesting. At this, at this meeting, we've got people from Bangladesh um, who've uh, got a huge thyroid problem because it's high rainfall in the, in the mountains in Bangladesh and so very low iodine, very poor country, no iodized salt. So they've got a huge thyroid problem. So the first nuclear medicine setup they had in their country and still probably one of the, most, the busiest part in their country is really about using radioiodine in very similar ways, mm -hmm. using very similar detection, just external probes, measuring the uptake, measuring thyroid uh, uh, uptake, treating thyroid, uh, overactive thyroid glands with uh, with radioiodine, and, and treating cancer is is still um, the bread and butter of many uh, nuclear medicine departments around the world, mm. and it's and it's very much the bread and butter in nuclear medicine departments which don't have a lot of other sophisticated resources, mm -hmm. um, and it's making a big difference, and it's a much cheaper thing. If you go and give radioactive iodine mm. to somebody, very simple, you're not exposing them to general anaesthetic, you're not mm. exposing the risk of general mm. anaesthetic, and there's considerable risk in general anaesthetic um, for giving, to removing the thyroid um, because, right. because it can swell and obstruct right. the airways. And, and limited side effects, which are really beautiful. I understand it acts like Pac-Man. The surgeons can go in and um, remove a certain amount of your thyroid. However, they're concerned about you know uh, the structure down there. It's a very bloody area, right? Yes, yeah, it's correct. Highly vascular. And also the... Um, the uh, vocal folds or whatever is yeah, in there the vocal too. Cords are there. Right, so you don't want to, you know, make yeah, that and, a problem. And, but yeah. it goes in like Pac-Man and just eats up the cancer. Right, uh, it's quite beautiful. You know, you know, no side effects, no hair loss, no, you know, right. sick feeling. Right, and um, and now we're, we've got uh, targeted much the same targets, mm -hmm. right? Much the same methodology for neuroendocrine tumors, which are tumors that can occur in the thyroid, but more often in the okay. in the gut and and mm. the pancreas and mm -hmm. so on. Um, but uh, we've got treatments now for prostate cancer, which is becoming mainstream. Uh, hopefully we can get to talk to some people about some of the breast cancer treatments mm. that are coming on. Targeted alpha cancer. Alpha therapies is one of the new mm. sorts of things that they're looking at. I mean, I think really a whole range of cancers based mm. on this magic bullet, this magic yes. bullet that was invented 
uh, a okay. long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I be also, persistent. I also like to make note that he overcame many challenges. Yes. For certain, um, there was a good deal of racism at the time, sure. um, in the 1930s, particularly in Boston. He was able to deal with the institutional politics that still exists, <laughs> as well as unethical practices in medical publication and um, the greed of the hospitals and the surgeons and the medical system, and that this treatment was, as you mentioned, relatively inexpensive. And finally, um, also with the fear that patients had, I mean, particularly after the war when they had just, you know, had the atomic bomb. So um, we, we really do owe a debt of gratitude yeah. to Dr. Saul Hertz and his colleague, the physicist, Dr. Arthur Roberts, for their tenacious nature, their vision, and their, pers their uh, persistence. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think as you made, that, those sort of problems still exist today, but I, I hope that we've, we're gradually getting rid of those sorts of issues, and, <laughs> yes. and I think we are. I mean, mm -hmm. I, the people who sponsored this meeting, um, there's people uh, here who are selfishly giving up their huge amounts of time and their own money mm -hmm. and their own uh, 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 time and effort, and to train others to help help improve the the quality of the world. And mm -hmm. I think uh, that's overwhelmingly what I see these days. But mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, pioneers like your dad have had a big <laughs> part of it. How can people find out more about you? Well, um, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, the SaulHertzMD.com uh, website lists all his um, published. Uh, work, and I'm very excited that current and future uh, scientists um, will have available to them his original work so that they can confer on it not only for the substantive scientific information but also see other aspects of the website that will provide inspiration. Excellent, that's fantastic, and thanks for speaking to us, and thanks Thank for you. speaking to the podcast in, in an unusual way and a different <laughs> way than we normally do. So, check out that website and and be persistent. Um, <laughs> it's taken decades, almost a century, mm. um, for this to really get it to its full strength. So yeah. you can make a difference if you're persistent and don't give up. Absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you.